it's my great pleasure and privilege to uh, introduce Nina Burley. Uh, Nina is a prolific writer, journalist, and author. Uh, she has a brand new book um, just about to come out. It is called Virus, Vaccinations, the CDC, and the Hijacking of America's Response to the Pandemic. It is a uh, very grippingly written narrative about how we messed this thing up. Um, Nina, welcome to the Health and Wealth of America. Thank you so much. Uh, I am going to ask the audience to indulge me briefly and just let one writer talk to another about process. Um, I think, you know, at least in New York, we kind of all watched this thing unfold in real time. And uh, at about the same time, you know, February, February, March of last year, and I, I kind of looked at it in horror and fear. But at some point, you looked at it and said, I got to write a book about this. And I'm curious, like, what was the, was there a particular episode or sort of aha moment that led you to, to, to think that, that, that this was a topic for a book? Well, actually, it was a phone call from the publisher. Uh, Dan Simon, who, who called me in dis early December, the very end of November, and said, hey, I want you to, I want someone to write a fast 50,000 word book on the race to the vaccine, because I think that's going to be an amazing story. And I need it by March. And I yeah. said, well, Dan, happy to do it. You know, I'm interested in science and I, I'm not, I, you know, I've done science writing, um, but I, I will do it if only if you let me write about what happened with the CDC first and what the what this administration what that at that time what the administration did in terms of that first couple of months of right. decision making and and so yeah like you I said I mean I I mean if I had to identify the moment where I thought this story kind of started it would be for me in that month of March, months of March and April, where we were sitting there with our jaws hanging open, going, well, well, well wait a minute, you know, where's the CDC and where's, where are the people, where's the leader, where are the leaders telling us, you know, what to do? And in, in meantime, we're watching every day, the more amazing uh, events leading up to, you know, the, um, the video of uh, of earth moving trucks in the potter's field up in the Bronx digging trenches for bodies like a scene out of uh, out of uh, I don't know uh, you know Pakistan after a uh, after a, a cyclone. I mean it was it was shameful. It was an outrage. And what was and you know every day we were waiting for them to step up and say here's what we're doing, and nothing was going on. And, and then, you know, and that, so I said, I'll happily write, write it for you, but I have to write about it. And then of course we started to understand what had been happening and, you know, it was all happening so fast and our jaws were hanging open and we were also paralyzed with panic and just our society had never ever confronted anything like this, um, that we didn't, we were, un, we were unable to, to log everything as it was happening. And so really that's what my goal was with that first essay was just to lay out what had happened. And then, and then of course I got to write about the vaccines. And then I, and I also said, you know, Dan, I'll write about, but I actually have to do also a, a chapter on the, uh, the conspiracy theories and the, and the hoax concept and, you know, all of that. So, right. so yeah, it was really, but it was really, I have to give it to Dan Simon. I did not raise my hand and call him up and say, Hey, I'm going to love to write this book. And so, yeah, I wrote it and it was a, it was a, a terrific, uh, you know, tour back into, um, you know, looking at what happened and really trying to just lay it out in a way that people can read it and assess and learn. And, and hopefully, in a, you know, this will happen again sometime and hopefully <laughs> everybody will expect a different kind of response from our leadership. Yeah, um, I should uh, just notify the audience, there is a link to buy Nina's book that's been put into the chat. Um, and also to say that you were particularly well positioned to cover the Trump administration because your last book was actually about the women in Donald Trump's life. Um, so the, the fundamental thesis of the book as I see it is that America's bungled response to COVID was the result not merely of incompetence and malice in the Trump administration, although that certainly played a role, but actually a much deeper 
and longer term deterioration of vitally important American institutions. So if I've got that about right, can you flesh out for the audience how and why we let those institutions rot? Well, sure. I mean, I, I guess when you talk about the institutions, you're talking about the CDC and, um, you know, the CDC was not rotting. Um, it was, it's a terrific um, uh, public health organization agency that the world looked to for a very long time, but um, it became a political football. It, it, it had been for a long time, kind of a political football. Every time the administrations would change parties, they would mess with the, you know, the, the website would change. And with the, with the Trump administration coming in, especially because they had to pay back the evangelical uh, community that had put him into office, really, um, he immediately put, set about putting people in charge of the CDC at the very top who were evangelicals. And, you know, Redfield is, comes from that community. Uh, Burks does. Alex Azar was a um, you know, I didn't know this until I, until I started looking into it. Alex Azar was the, uh, is an evangelical who, who, um, who was the, the sponsor of, um, of cabinet prayer ministry meetings inside the White House. The founders of our country be rolling in their graves over, over what they were doing in, the, in, in this. You know, you're not, you're not supposed to put prayer meetings inside the White House and they were doing it weekly. He was a sponsor of it. So they gave the public health agencies over to these, uh, these you know, zealots or, I mean, you know, again, I'm not gonna call Redfield and Burke zealots. They, they, are, they do their job, they were doing, they're medical people, but they have a constituency on that side. And their concern, their eye was not on the ball of a virus coming. Their eye was on how can we use these public health agencies to promote our kind of moral view of, 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 um, of behavior. And of course, you know, sex comes under sexual behavior, LGBTQ stuff. You know, the first thing they did with the HHS was they went in there and said, okay, we're going to put a button on our agency's front of our website saying anybody who has any kind of religious liberty objections to any kind of health related op op uh, 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 activities, you know, a pharmacist, a doctor can press this button and you'll, we will come to your aid. In other words, they were ready to go to the aid of people who were going to say, we don't want to be involved with uh, birth control, selling birth control or abortion or, you know, all of these issues that, you know, the transgender stuff, they were, that's, that's where their eye was. Mm. Right. And so it wasn't on the, you know, incoming. Now, of course, you know, uh, again, previous administrations and Democrats too probably weren't because if you look at again back to the institutions, the um, the priorities of our leadership in this country for decades, my entire lifetime certainly, have been to spend a lot of discretionary budget money on defense. Between forty and seventy percent of discretionary budget has gone to defense since nineteen sixty. Meanwhile, three to 6% of the discretionary budget goes to public health. That's really all you need to know. This is, and, and now we, and suddenly we confront a, a deadly virus that killed more Americans than world, you know, this has been said over and over, than World War II, Vietnam, and Korea combined. And yet the money that we have poured into the defense industries dwarfs public health by orders of magnitude. So it's a priorities thing. And it, it's, it's, you know, I mean, I think they, you know, the CDC became this politicized, I mean, even more politicized as the co as COVID, you know, we know that after COVID came and they, they were, it was an election year, they started to politicize and mess with the data, which was, which is really outrageous. Uh, but I don't think the CDC was in full rot mode uh, yeah. before that. I wouldn't say that. I think it's, it's more, you know, our society's acceptance of certain priorities that maybe need to be reconsidered a little bit. Yeah. Um, one of the things I think that, uh, that tripped us up, it, it goes to your point about the evangelical priorities over the scientific priorities was, especially in the very beginning, 
it, it didn't seem like the, the the science messaging was very strong or clear, um, you know, particularly with regard to wearing masks. They got the word out early, and this was sort of deliberate and maybe sort of coincidental that actually you shouldn't wear a mask because if you're because masks are in short supply and you're taking them away from the people who really need them, and then all of a sudden we did this 180 somewhere in the spring. No, actually, you have to wear a mask, um, and that 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 messaging really made it difficult to to enforce anything absolutely um, because people were so confused so can you talk a little bit about how how that evolved and, and who was responsible for that sure i mean you know that is one of the mistakes that were you cannot pin on the former administration uh, entirely it, it, you know the who was all was all was not Advise, advising mask wearing early the World on. Health Organization. The who the World Health Organization yeah. was not advising it, um, and doctors in America were not. I mean, top you know uh, leaders of the health uh, uh, the health agencies in this country, and they weren't doing it po for political reasons. Were not advising it. Um, I mean, I guess you could argue that at some point there was a pol some kind of a political calculus going on when. You know, they the U.S. Post Office was going to send a mask to every home, man, woman, and child, or every address in America. And the Trump administration said, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, no, that's going to set off a panic. Don't do that." Mm -hmm. um, that came later, but yeah, it, the, this the, the blame. There's enough blame to go around on that mistake that it, it, you cannot pin that to the administration. What happened was, of course, <laughs> and the, the where they do come in is that they they you know they immediately. Uh, it became, you know, you're wearing a mask. It was like wearing a Biden sign on your face, you right, know, right. and it politicized and, and it was it was a very uh, bad idea to do that because I, you can still find people in uh, in this country. I met one the other day in Florida, um, otherwise <laughs> well educated or, you know, wealthy uh, American man saying, uh, I've heard that masks don't do anything and I wouldn't, right. I, I don't wear them at all if I don't have to. And so, yeah, they made that, that was a blunder early on. Yeah. Uh, one of the most distinctive parts of your book is you, you have an entire chapter or essay uh, devoted to the role played by conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that, I thought, well, you know, tr Trump and his supporters are well known, you know, kind of advocates or, or, or abusers of conspiracy theories. So it's not that surprising. But at the same time, you explain really interestingly why conspiracy theories are particularly mm -hmm. likely to take root in a time of a pandemic. Can you uh, elaborate on that a bit? Well, sure. I mean, first of all, historically, uh, these types, these moments, I mean, if you going back to Daniel Defoe's Journal of the Plague Year, which covered a 17th century London uh, uh, plague, uh, um, plague, plague, plague uh, pandemic, the um, conspiracy theories flourish. I mean, people just are grasping at, you know, anything and, and always retrospect, retro, retrospectively, they would say, oh, you know, the soothsayers had seen it a comet or, you know, there, this was, this was God's payback for that misbehavior by that monarch or something, you know, there was always some conspiracy, some superstitious explanation. Right. Um, and so now I think what's happening is yes, of course you had the, the Trumpy, uh, you know, deep state stuff, but the, and the QAnon stuff, which it's just flourished under with this situation. But again, I don't think you can situate that entirely in the Fox News, it's COVID is a hoax sort of no. echo chamber. I think that's part of it, but I think we are, you know, again, in my my generation, we grew up in, and yours too, we grew up in uh, the baby boom really came of age with the national security state, with this metastasizing of national secrets, with the concept of there's, you know, this country has secret labs making bioweapons. I mean, we know that we know and we know it culturally. It's like we grew up with movies about it. And, the, you know, all the way back in the 50s with the blob and, you know, the radiation, the, you know, so we are we have this like sort of dark secret, you know, sense of these dark secrets that, you know, there is some truth to that. And when something like a zombie plague comes along and it did come out of probably spilled out of a lab in China. Now a lot more scientists be, are beginning to agree with that 
an accidental leak. You, you just have people, you know, they're very, we're very willing to, we're primed to under, yeah. to, to sort of t- believe that, that, you know, believe anything um, that, you know, there are people or that, that we have, you know, Dr. Knows out there or something who are willing to, uh, to create, um, you know, pandemonium. And then we've got, you know, evil, look, the dark science of the Cold War is that, well, that's what I sort of talk about, that, that, that has primed a lot of people in my generation to, um, to believe that the government is capable of all sorts of things. And, and that's at the root of a lot of the QAnon stuff, I think. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about the, the, the science of the vaccine. You go mm-hmm. into some detail about messenger RNA and, and this sort of cutting edge science. And one of the things I learned from reading your book, you know, it's, it, I think if you had asked me a year ago, uh, or I think, I think today, if, I, if you had asked me a year ago, if I knew what Moderna was, I would have said yes. But I think in reality, I didn't know what Moderna was a year ago. Um, and you remind us in the book how, what a relatively small company this was mm-hmm. from a, you know, in the, in, the, in the world of pharmaceutical companies. Mm-hmm. So you talk a little bit about the scientists and the, uh, the, the race to, to, de- de- to develop these new vaccines? Yeah, well, I mean, one of the most fascinating things about this story is that in this milieu of, of you know, distrust of experts and conspiracy theories galore and you know bill gates is going to inject us with 5g chips and so on in the middle of this we have witnessed a um a milestone in medicine happening right in front of our eyes the chinese released the genome of that virus to the world three days late in january i think of of 2020 three days later they had, these scientists had a vaccine figured out. They yeah. just had to get it tested. And, you know, this type of vaccine, um, the, the messenger RNA uh, platform is completely different from the vaccines that have saved our, you know, saved our children's lives from all sorts of childhood diseases that is based on the first vaccine developed back in the late 18, or late 1700s, you know, the, uh, the cowpox, the, the weakened, the attenuated virus vaccine, where they took the live viruses and they attenuated them until they were weakened and weakened them and then injected them. And then whatever didn't kill you made you stronger. That was the concept of the vaccine right. all the way up until now. And this, this platform is going to change everything. I mean, it's going to change the way that uh, other viruses are, you know, because they were able to do this with such speed. And now you see other countries are doing their own mRNA. So it's, it's, a, it's going to change everything. Other viruses are going to emerge and there will, you know, there, there is now the, the capability with AI at, to create the, in, in just in minutes, create this little strand of proteins or this little strand of our RNA, the messenger RNA that doesn't even stay in your body, that just tells your cells, look out for this shape and go after it if it comes. And then it just evaporates. It's amazing. And um, it really is, you know, one of the things that this country, I have to say that Trump, you know, they, they threw money at these companies and they said to them, they, 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 they took away one of the huge hurdles of getting things over what they call the valley of death in this clinical testing situation, which is that if something goes wrong, if somebody develops some problems, they have to stop it. And it can take 15 years to get it from, you know, concept to pass. So, and that's why you're seeing right now with like the J and J thing, you know, people, six people out of many, many millions have these clot, had these clots. It's a very rare side effect. The, the story of vaccines and vaccine development of the 20th century, which la- really extended the lifespan of Americans by like 20 years, and it's incredible. They, um, that, that, vex- that, that development um, over, those year, uh, over those years has, has really changed the lifespan of Americans. And this, this, this type of thing, um, uh, you know, was always, there was always going to be it's, it's, a, it's a push and pull 
with the vaccine development between conspiracy theories, vaccine hesitation, actual accidents and problems, and then these huge leaps ahead where life, life is extended. So, um, you know, we've just witnessed something really, really amazing that science, these, and I'm not gonna name them all, but there are lots and lots of people involved who, um, who have really uh, moved the ball in terms of, you know, how we're gonna, you know, the future and how we're going to survive future viral attacks. Um, we only have a couple more minutes. I, I did want to get a quick question in from the audience. John Madison asks if you interviewed Michael Osterholm, Osterholm uh, who was, I guess was in the Obama administration for your book? No. no. Okay. Um, so one of the big questions when we have crises like this is whether people and leaders have the capacity to learn from previous mistakes. Uh, yesterday, at this conference, Joseph Stiglitz told us that, in his opinion, the Biden stimulus was so much larger and more effective than the Obama stimulus because economists and policy experts actually concluded that the earlier effort was insufficient. So do you think we've learned enough from this crisis to better prepare us for the next pandemic, or are the structural problems so pronounced that we're just doomed to repeat the same mistakes? I, no, I actually think that that we are we are learned, we have learned, and the rollout, especially once the political situation simmered down and we had a kind of a more, let's say, calm leadership situation um, where they were willing to use the apparatus of the government to get things moving, which is was not going on with the previous administration because they wanted to prove that the private and en private enterprise really could do the job of government. I think these guys have learned. Uh, I think there, there are lessons here that will have will be taken forward. Um, you know, is it going to lead to some kind of transformational change? I un unfortunately doubt it. I don't think that we're we're going to learn a lot about uh, how to pr protect ourselves from uh, these future mut mutations and that that come out of kind of man man made situations. I I don't think. I hope that they take this to heart, but I don't think it's going to change maybe the way the labs operate which they, that's a whole other conversation because I think there is a lot of evidence that the Chinese, that that Wuhan lab had a, uh, had, there, there were some issues there. Fascinating. Uh, well, Nina, uh, we have to break for yoga now, uh, but thank you for this conversation. And thank <laughs> you for writing dog. Such, a, such an excellent book. Thank you so much. Okay. All right, take care.